The Origin of the Earth, Rock Layers and Fossils. This is the second part of this lecture. In our previous session together, we uh, explained the evolutionary view of the history of the Earth, that it formed in a, uh, as a part of a big vast cloud around the sun that collapsed into a disk and then evolved into uh, rings that evolved into the planets. And then over millions of years, about five, about 4.6 uh, billion years, <clears throat> the rock layers of uh, igneous rock, metamorphic rocks, and then the sedimentary rocks with fossils in them formed. And uh, then we contrasted that with the biblical view that God created the earth about 6,000 years ago. The very lowest rocks of the earth are creation weak rocks. And then uh, most of the sedimentary rocks are uh, the result of Noah's flood. And then some of the sedimentary rocks and fossils were produced in post-flood, more localized uh, catastrophic events. We talked about the fact that the evolutionists say that from uh, the first living cell up to the present time is about three and a half billion years. That is the evolution of life. And uh, we presented a number of lines of argument that the rock layers are not the record of millions of years of history, but in fact, um, are a testimony to Noah's flood uh, about four and a half thousand years ago. And so we gave a number of different lines of uh, geological evidence for that. We want to now talk about dating methods, but before I do, um, I want to just mention uh, something about the ice ages because I didn't know where else to fit it in here. But um, the secular view is that there have been at least four major ice ages uh, separated by thousands, tens of thousands of years. And um, they have advanced and retreated. But in a biblical view, um, there's only one ice age, and we think it was uh, post-flood caused by the conditions at the end of the flood. In fact, you need unusual conditions to make an ice age because you have to have warm oceans that are evaporating a lot of water, falling on cool continents that uh, then precipitate as snow rather than rain, and then uh, continuing cool summers so that that snow doesn't melt, and you build up the snow, which then gets packed into ice. How do you get uh, warm oceans and cold continents? Well, in Noah's flood, you had the fountains of the great deep bursting open, and um, that indicates, that language indicates it's subterranean waters coming from inside the earth. It's uh, logical to assume that would be hot water, like hot briny vents on the ocean floor today. And creation scientists who have studied this and tried to model what was going on in the flood uh, think that the average temperature of the ocean uh, warmed up to maybe about 80 degrees. So you have very warm oceans, but then you're going to have a lot of aerosols and ashes in the atmosphere because of all the volcanic activity associated with um, earthquake activity during the flood. And so the, the, uh, the sunlight is going to be um, blocked to a significant degree. The land always cools faster than the water anyway, and so you're going to have a lot of precipitation, a lot of evaporation from the oceans falling in the form of snow and building up uh, over um, decades. And uh, creation scientists believe that the ice age lasted maybe uh, a couple hundred, 300 uh, years after the flood uh, as then the ice began to retreat to where it uh, basically is today. So during the ice age, there's evidence that um, much of North America, uh, north of Cincinnati, where the United States is, uh, where the Creation Museum is, and much of Europe and Russia was covered in uh, snow and ice. And when you have all of that water from the ocean evaporating and then falling on the land and staying as snow and not going back into the rivers to flow back into the ocean, you're going to lower sea level. And so that's going to produce land bridges. And today there's gaps between a lot of the uh, land. But uh, during the Ice Age, uh, we think because we know that the ocean, for example, is quite shallow between Russia and Alaska, 
and uh, between England and Europe and between Southeast Asia and Australia, uh, you would have land bridges for animals and for people to migrate and get to other places after the flood. So, uh, for example, a quite wide swath there between modern-day Russia and Alaska would allow for uh, much migration of animals and people. Well, what about the age of the Earth? As we noted, the evolutionists say that the Earth is about 4.6 billion years old. Life has been here about three and a half billion years. But the Bible says it's all about 6,000 years. And we're told that radiometric dating proves the rocks are millions of years old. But before we look at the radiometric dating methods, uh, we should note that there are hundreds of physical processes that limit the age of the Earth and the universe. Um, any kind of physical process could theoretically be used as a clock to measure uh, the time in the past. You have a process that's being observed today, and uh, the rate at, that pro at which that process is occurring, and then if that rate has always been the same, you can just extrapolate back to figure out, well, when did that process begin? And so uh, sci creation scientists have uh, discovered that uh, from studying the research of others, that more than 90% of these processes give an age uh, far less than billions or millions of years. Let me give you just a few examples. Take helium in the atmosphere. Um, helium is produced from radioactive ice uh, decay of elements in the Earth, and that helium atom is uh, very small, and it can wiggle its way through the crystalline structure of the rock and gets into the atmosphere. And then we know that some of that helium escapes into outer space. But the amount of helium going into the atmosphere is more than the amount of helium leaving. And so um, studies of this have been done. And uh, all the helium that is now in the atmosphere, based on what we know of the rates and using evolutionist assumptions about constancy of rate, all of that helium would, mac would accumulate in a maximum of 2 million years. But the evolutionists say the atmosphere is millions and millions, hundreds of millions, no, billions of years old. Uh, we could talk about the human population, and we have talked about that in a previous session. I'll mention it again when we talk about uh, human origins. But the current population of the world can be explained by the growth of population since uh, the time of Noah. But if the evolutionary dating methods are right, there should be a lot more human bones in the earth, um, fossilized and unfossilized, preserved, than we find. Uh, then we could consider sodium salt in the, in the ocean. Uh, scientists have discovered that there are various ways for salt to get into the ocean. And there are some ways for the salt to get out of the ocean. And those uh, processes of intake and outtake have been uh, measured. And using evolutionist uniformitarian assumptions, um, if there was no salt in the ocean at the beginning, all the salt that we have in the ocean today would accumulate in a maximum of 62 million years. Now, creation scientists don't believe that's the age of the ocean. They believe that the flood would have brought a lot of sodium into the ocean. Um, but evolutionists say the oceans are uh, over 3 billion years old. It doesn't fit the evidence from the salt. We could uh, also look at the Earth's magnetic field. Uh, the Earth's magnetic field protects the, uh, the Earth from radiation from the sun. And uh, it's decaying. It's known to be decaying at about 5% per century. 6,000 years ago, in the biblical time scale, the magnetic field would have been strong but livable. But if, we, if the Earth is really millions of years old, life would have been impossible at a much stronger magnetic field. If the magnetic uh, field's decay has been in a freefall decay, that could push the maximum age of the Earth back maybe 9,000 years or so. But if it was a dynamic decay, as some creation researchers uh, believe, that at the flood, 
that was so catastrophic, you had uh, a significant decay and rapid reversals of the uh, magnetic field represented in the fossil, in the, in the rock layers, then it would fit with uh, the 6,000 year age that the Bible talks about. We could also consider the oldest living plants. It's really, really strange. We have some very old plants, trees like Methuselah. Uh, in 1957, it was dated to be about 4,700 years old. Why don't we have plants that can live so long? Why don't we have plants that live way much longer than that? That fits the biblical time scale. Doesn't make sense uh, in an evolutionary time scale. We could talk about the rotation of spiral galaxies, and I did mention this in the lecture that we talked about uh, uh, the origin of the heavenly bodies. Uh, the spiral arms of these spiral galaxies should not exist if these galaxies are billions of years old, as the evolutionists say. And uh, if you want to dig into that, there's an article by Dr. Danny Faulkner on our website, and you can search for that. Well, there are many other examples that refute the millions of years, but let's look at those dating methods, uh, carbon dating and the other radioisotope dating methods. Now, we need to know a couple of facts about these dating methods. First, we need to know that radioactive decay was only discovered in the 1890s. That's when they found out that there were some elements that were unstable and decayed or changed into other elements. But it took them a few years, once they knew that, to develop uh, dating methods using those radioactive isotopes. And those were developed in the 1910s. So, geologists were already committed to millions of years almost a hundred years before radiometric dating methods were invented. So contrary to what many people think, radiometric dating methods did not convince people of millions of years. They were already convinced for other reasons. And as I have shown in um, my lecture, previous lecture on where the idea of millions of years came from, it didn't come from the rocks and the fossils. It came from anti-biblical philosophical, religious assumptions that were imposed on the geological evidence. But let's look at radiometric dating. We can illustrate what's going on in this uh, dating method by thinking of a, an hourglass. And uh, there are some atoms or isotopes that are radioactive. They decay, they're unstable. And they decay into what um, American or Western scientists call daughter uh, atoms and, um, or I isotopes. So we can say that the sand at the top, which is red, represents the parent, or uh, as Europeans say, the mother uh, isotopes, and the green sand represents the daughter isotopes. So this is how the dating method then works. You have the parent or mother uh, in the top of the hourglass, you have the daughter in the bottom. And for this to be a reliable clock, you need to make three assumptions. You need to know those assumptions are correct. The first assumption is, well, when the clock started, uh, what were the ori original ratios? Was all the sand in the top of the clock or was some already in the bottom of the clock when the clock was turned over and started? Second, you have to know that the sand has always been falling uh, in the clock at a constant rate. Uh, if you assume a certain rate and it was much faster or much slower in the past, you don't have a reliable clock. Uh, and then you have to know that that clock has been a closed system, that no sand has been added or removed from the system once it started. We could use uh, uh, an illustration. Let's say your mom makes a cake and she uses an hourglass in the kitchen there to measure how long to leave the cake in the oven. And so she sets the, 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 the clock and um, she leaves to go do some other things. And uh, your little nasty brother comes into the kitchen and uh, he looks at that hourglass and he decides he's going to turn it over. So now some of the sand is already in the bottom. Uh, 
now it's no longer a reliable clock because when mom comes back and looks at that, she's going to uh, either have um, a, a heart attack thinking that things have been uh, not cooking long enough or something's wrong. Uh, what if your uh, little brother lifted the top off that uh, hourglass and he poured a few drops of water in the sand? Now the sand is sticky. It's not going to flow as quickly as it was before. Or what if he poured more sand in the top or drilled a hole in the kitchen table and let some of the sand leak out? If you don't know that the system started with all the sand at the top and a constant decay rate and that there hasn't been any sand added or removed, you don't have a reliable clock. Well, each of these assumptions in the radiometric dating methods uh, are highly questionable. In fact, they can't be proven scientifically. Well, let's uh, explain this a little bit more uh, with a concept called half-life. Half-life describes the fact that as a radioactive isotope um, decays, in a certain amount of time, half of those atoms will decay into a daughter isotope. So the half-life of uranium changing into lead is four and a half billion years. So after one half-life, four and a half billion years, half of those atoms would be changed into lead and half of them would be still uranium. After another half-life, uh, half of the remaining uranium atoms would be changed into lead. And after another half-life, half of those remaining ones. And so it would happen again until eventually you wouldn't have any uranium. It would be all decayed to lead. Now, the decay process for uranium is complex, and it goes through about 15 steps before it reaches the stable isotope of lead. And different isotopes have different half-lives. So potassium argon uh, has a half-life of 1.3 billion years. Uranium changing into lead half-life of 4.5 billion years. Rubidium changing into strontium has a half-life of uh, 49 billion years. So very, very different clocks. And uh, carbon-14, in contrast, decays very rapidly. And unlike these other isotopes, carbon-14 is made in the atmosphere. So let's first think about carbon-14 a little bit more, and then we'll look at these others. Carbon-14 is produced by cosmic ray bombardment of the atmosphere that um, hits nitrogen atoms and converts some of them into carbon-14. Then the carbon-14 um, is absorbed by the plants. They, they love carbon-14, uh, but they can't tell the difference between carbon-14 and carbon-12. So they absorb the plants through the carbon dioxide and... Uh, and so they become radioactive because they have those carbon-14 atoms that are decaying. Um, then the, the animals come and they eat the plants, and so they now have carbon-14 in their bodies, and so they are now radioactive. And so the plants and the animals are taking in carbon-14. Um, it's decaying, but they're constantly eating or constantly absorbing carbon dioxide in the case of plants. And so there's basically an equilibrium. But when they die, they stop taking in carbon of any kind, carbon-14 especially. And so that then can become a clock because we can know how much was in the bone at the time of death. And then we can measure how much is in the bones um, when we find them. And if we know the rate of decay, we can calculate how long ago that creature died. So during uh, a plant or anim animal's lifetime, it's taking in carbon-14, uh, but it's losing carbon-14 through decay, but it's basically in equilibrium. So when the creature dies, then it stops taking in the uh, carbon-14. The carbon-14 decay process continues. <clears throat> so again, you have the carbon-12, carbon-14 ratio. At the moment of death, they stop getting any more carbon-12, and it begins to, the carbon-14 begins to decay gradually until it becomes an immeasurable amount of carbon-14, or radiocarbon. 
This is a reliable dating method only if we assume, one, that the rate of production of carbon-14 in the atmosphere has always been the same, and two, that the rate of decay of carbon-14 back into nitrogen-14 has been constant throughout time. But creation scientists who've investigated this think that there are very good reasons related to Noah's flood to think that both of those assumptions are false. But <clears throat> carbon-14 is never used to date rocks and fossils, except by creationists. We'll get back to that in a moment. But consider this statement on carbon dating. A complete rewrite of the history of modern humans could be needed after a breakthrough in archaeological dating techniques. British and American scientists have found radiocarbon dating used to give a rough guide to the age of an object can be wrong by thousands of years. They found that the carbon dates were wrong by thousands of years and that the further back in time they went, the more out of date they were. And creation scientists would, would say that this is explained by the flood. You go back maybe 2,000 years to the time of Jesus, it's a reasonably reliable dating method. But the closer you get to the flood, because of how the flood would have affected how much carbon was in the atmosphere, um, possibly uh, the change in the decay of the magnetic field would affect how much bombardment of uh, nitrogen atoms would produce the uh, carbon-14 atoms. These factors, the closer you get to the flood, the more unreliable the dating method becomes because the assumptions that we're using uh, don't apply. They, they're not accurate. Well, let's give some examples to show that this carbon dating is not reliable. As I said, evolutionists will not use carbon dating to uh, date things that they think are millions of years old. But creationists believe, on the basis of the eyewitness testimony of the Creator in Genesis, that the Earth is young and that the flood was global and produced the geological record of rock layers and fossils. Well, um, this again is the chart uh, that the evolutionists might use to picture the history of the earth, of the rock layers. And uh, there are coal deposits in three major places in that geological record. The Eocene deposit 36 to 57 million years ago, the Cretaceous coal deposit 66 to 144 million years ago, they say, and the Pennsylvania deposits 286 to 320 million years ago. So a vast period of time between these uh, coal deposits, which evolutionists say formed in swamps over thousands and thousands of years. Well, creation scientists decided to use carbon-14 dating on coal because coal is 100% carbon. And so they got samples from these three different uh, coal deposits in the United States, samples that are uh, stored in the, uh, the geological uh, rock bank. I think it's at the University of Pennsylvania or Pencil Penn State University, uh, kept very carefully under um, strict uh, conditions. They got samples and uh, they applied carbon dating to these rocks and the results they got back were they all, all of these samples have had a carbon-14 age of 70,000 years. That's using the, the uh, evolutionary assumptions. The creation scientists don't believe that's the real age because they think the assumptions are wrong. But what this indicates is that all of these coals in these three different layers at different levels in the geological record were all the same age, meaning they were all formed at the same time, strongly supporting the global flood view. Well, diamonds are 100% pure carbon. And so creation scientists decided to get some diamonds and see if they could date those with carbon-14. And uh, <clears throat> so they got some diamonds that were from rock layers that by potassium argon dating were uh, the, the, the uh, rock layers that contained the diamonds were dated to be one to two billion years old. So the diamonds are in those, they must be that old too. But when they did the carbon dating, 
they found that the age of these diamonds was about 55,000 years. Again, using evolutionary assumptions. They don't believe they're really that old. Um, but how can you have 55,000 year old diamonds completely encased in one to two billion year old rocks? Doesn't make any sense. And it calls into question, well, it calls into question both dating methods. You can read more about carbon dating and understanding the basics of that in uh, our website. A three-part article is there by our scientist, Dr. Andrew Snelling. Well, let's look at the long-age radiometric dating. Uranium into lead, potassium into argon, these ones that have uh, a half-life in, in terms of billions of years. Well, the dating begins when the lava hardens into rock. The lava comes out of the ground. It has uh, these radioactive isotopes in it. And then it hardens into rock. And once the rock hardens, then the clock begins. Um, I want to show you a short video from, it's, it's one of six mini videos in this excellent little uh, video called Check This Out. It's on radiometric dating. It will help to understand the process here. Nearly every textbook in science magazine teaches that the Earth is billions of years old, and the primary dating method used for determining this is what is called radioisotope dating, or radiometric dating. Now this is a reliable method for measuring absolute ages of rocks and the age of the Earth, right? Huh. First off, many scientists now regard the age of the Earth to be between 4.55 and 4.6 billion years old. Okay. So if this method is reliable and accurate, why the 50 million year discrepancy? And that seems like a lot. But let's get into some details here and see what's going on. Keep in mind that there's all kinds of scientific jargon on this topic, and so we'll just present a very straightforward, simplified version of the process. Radiometric dating is the process of estimating the ages of rocks based on the decay of radioactive elements in them. Basically, there are certain kinds of atoms in nature that are unstable and spontaneously decay into other kinds of atoms. For instance, uranium will radioactively decay through a series of steps until it becomes the stable element called lead. The original element is called the parent element, and the end result is called the daughter element. Radioisotope dating is commonly used to date igneous rocks, rocks which formed when hot molten material cooled and solidified. The dating clock started when the rock cooled. During the molten state, it is assumed that the intense heat forced any gaseous daughter elements to escape. It is assumed that once the rock cooled, no more atoms escaped, and any daughter element now found in the rock is a result of radioactive decay since that rock formed. The decay rate is measured in terms of half-life, that is the length of time it takes half of the remaining atoms of a radioactive parent element to decay. Now, of course, that can be measured in a laboratory, and it is assumed that since we know the decay rate, we can calculate backwards and come up with the age of the rock. But is that all there is to it? Here's where it gets tricky. It's true we can measure a decay rate using observational science, but there's another kind of science that is required to accurately calculate dates for rocks, and that is what we call historical science. Historical science deals with the things in the past, and therefore it cannot be repeated and tested. Dating methods require both types of science, because in order to get accurate rock dates, one would have to accurately know both the decay rate and the initial conditions of the rock sample, right? Since radioisotope dating uses both types of science, we can't directly measure the ages of rocks. There are assumptions involved. For instance, how do we know what the initial conditions were in the rock sample? How do we know the amounts of parent or daughter elements now in that sample haven't been altered by other processes in the past? How does someone know the decay rate has remained constant since the rock formed? The answer is, they don't. Let's simplify here and talk about a typical hourglass. Let's say you walk into a room and you see an hourglass with sand at the top and sand at the bottom, and some sand sprinkling from the top chamber to the bottom. Well, observational science would allow us to see and measure the sand, and then calculate how long the hourglass has been running, right? We could make our sand measurements and then calculate when the hourglass was turned over, right? Well, those calculations could be wrong because we may have failed to consider some major assumptions. Like, was there any sand at the bottom when the hourglass was turned over? Has any sand been added or taken out of the hourglass? Has the sand always been falling at a constant rate? Since we did not observe the initial conditions when the hourglass started, and we haven't been watching the sand all the time since then, we must make assumptions. All three of those assumptions can affect our time calculations. Now, of course, there's more to understanding all of this, but enough said. So that's a great little video with some very, very good uh, explanatory short videos that I would recommend to you. So you've got these dating assumptions. Uh, what were the original ratios 
uh, when the lava came out of the ground and hardened into rock? Uh, has the decay rate been constant since the rock formed? And have any of those isotopes, daughter or parent, moved in or out of the rock? And some of these are gas. Uh, they can wiggle their way through the rock. Some of these are water soluble. They can move through the rock. So you have to know your sample is a co closed system all the time since it was uh, formed. But we see a number of examples where rocks of known age were dated with radiometric dating and gave completely wrong dates. Mount St. Helens, I mentioned before, erupted in May 1980. And uh, <clears throat> it blew off about a third of the mountaintop. Big crater formed and lava continued to ooze into that crater. After everything settled down, um, there, there was a lava dome forming there and solidifying. And, uh, Dr. Steve Austin, a creation PhD geologist, went up on the mountain um, <clears throat> about a decade after everything had settled down. He collected samples of that lava dome. He sent them off to a radiometric dating laboratory after he had prepared them <clears throat> the way his professors uh, at the university taught him. He did not tell them where he got the rocks. He wanted a blind analysis. He simply said they were recent. Well, they applied four different methods to those rocks, and the results came back that these rocks are 340,000 to 2.8 million years old. But they were actually all less than 12 years old when they were dated. So the dating methods were wrong by just a little bit. Another example. Uh, this mountain in New Zealand is a very famous mountain. It was the Mountain of Doom in uh, one of the movies. In the summer, uh, it's not snow covered. And so uh, people can identify, and geologists have identified, different lava flows associated with the five eruptions between 1949 and 1975. Dr. Andrew Snelling is Australian. He went over to New Zealand and collected samples of those five eruptions. He sent them off to a radiometric dating laboratory. He did not tell them where he got the rocks. He wanted a blind analysis. The results came back uh, using the potassium argon method, which at that time was considered the most reliable, that these rocks are 270,000 to 3.5 million years old. But they were all less than 50 years old when the rocks were formed. So again, they were wrong. The dating methods were wrong by a considerable amount. In the published scientific literature, there are many examples where rocks of known age, where there were human observers who saw the volcano erupt and the lava come out of the ground, they give wrong dates. These, uh, these volcanoes erupted in relatively recent history. The dating method should give a date of, of zero or can't even measure it, just a short period of time. But they give ages of hundreds of thousands or millions of years for rocks we know are only decades or centuries old. And so repeatedly when they take rocks of known age and apply these methods, they don't work. But evolutionists want us to take rocks of unknown age where there was no human eyewitness to observe the lava coming out of the ground and they want us to assume that the methods work but that doesn't make any sense. If they don't work on the rocks we do know the age of, why should we trust them on the rocks we don't know the age of? Let me give you another example. In a mine in Australia, uh, they dug down through the sands and clays and uh, down in the molten lava, they found some uh, wood entombed 60 feet down. They decided to carbon date the wood and they dated the layer. The wood, um, <clears throat> the, the basalt was dated to be 45 million years old, but the wood by carbon dating was dated to be uh, 44 to 45,000 years old. How do you get wood that's only 45,000 years old entombed in basalt that is 45 million years old? Something is wrong with the dating methods. I've also seen an example of this as I have had the privilege of going to the Grand Canyon and going on river trips down the Grand Canyon uh, for many years. 
And uh, each year that we make a trip, we get a, uh, almost every year, we get a, a revised copy of the Grand Canyon River Guide. And uh, it explains the canyon from a evolutionary perspective. And it has uh, charts that tell you the ages of the rocks. So I've been collecting these as I've gone uh, over the years and uh, notice that there's a change in the dates of the rocks. In the 1997 edition, they said that the layers span from uh, the Tapit sands on the lowest layer up to the, the top, the uh, Kaibab, 570 to 245 million years ago. So 325 million years to lay down those layers. But in the 2007 edition, they had the layers spanning 545 to 250 million years ago, only 295 million years to lay down those layers. So I did the math. In 10 years, the Grand Canyon layers got 30 million years younger by radiometric dating. Well, then the, uh, the 2007 edition had 295 million years for the layers. The 2011 and I kept checking through 2016, they said the layers were 255 million years. So in four more years, it became 40 million years younger. So from 1997 to 2011, 14 years, the canyon became 70 million years younger. Again, 1997, 325 million years. The 2020 edition, only 235 million years. It starts at 505 million years ago. It ends at 270 million years. So in 23 years, the canyon grew 90 million years younger.